Lorna Jean Edmonds is Vice Provost for Global Affairs and International Studies, as well as Professor in the College of Health Sciences and Professions at Ohio University. She has held senior executive jobs with the Universities of Toronto, Ottawa, and Western, and she has a deep interest in space governance. She joins us at the Star Spot, live on location at the 2015 International Space Development Conference in Toronto. So the Star Spot is still on location here at the International Space Development Conference 2015 in Toronto, and we're very pleased to be joined now by Lorna Jean Edmonds. Thanks for being here at the Star Spot. Pleasure to be here. Uh, Lorna, you've had a number of uh, very senior executive jobs at a number of universities, U of T, uh, University of Ottawa, Western, uh, often in international relations positions. Mm -hmm. And so from the point of view of somebody who's worked uh, in, in governance policy and in management, why is space governance so important? Very good question. Well, for one thing, when you start from a university perspective, I'm very interested in the next generation of talent. Mm -hmm and both in terms of the research and scholarship that you do in a university and the innovation that comes out of it, but most importantly, the innovators and the next generation of leaders that are going to be responsible for governing Earth, whether it's in the private or the public sector. What I fundamentally believe is that the next frontier is not globalization. I think it will be, we will remember this century as the century of universalization, meaning that the world within the universe will be at the heart of the kinds of issues that you will have to face. Uh, and so in so doing, it, it interests me because I want to look at it from the perspective of what do universities need to do in order to create the enabling environment for all of our students to learn and get excited about the opportunities in space, while at the same time look at the challenges that we also face. Fundamentally, the area that I worry about the most is not the fantastic innovations out there. It's more about the question, is it that those who get who govern the galaxy govern Earth? And if so, who will those actors be? Now, one of the examples I just saw you give um, by way of comparison has to do with how we've approached Antarctica, right. where nobody owns it, but everybody, yeah, at least in theory, can use it. Is that still a fair governance framework for looking at outer space? Yes and no. I think the distinction with outer space, and again, I'm not an expert in outer space, but fundamentally going to outer space is a lot more difficult right. than going to Antarctica. Not to suggest that Antarctica is easy to go to, but it is a lot easier than going to outer space. We can breathe in, our t in Antarctica. We can't breathe in outer mm -hmm. space. There are fewer stations. There are fewer infrastructure for people to work within in the outer space context. So it, it's a whole new it's a whole new concept. It's not like another country. And I think that's, again, something that we need to take, you know, keep in mind is that I don't think that the current international relations and multilateral trade agreements that we use on Earth, I don't think we can apply them in the same context as the universe because the universe is that. It's the universe. You know, in a way, Earth is just a home in a suburb in the Milky Way, so to speak, as a colleague, Joe Shields, uh, once quoted a few years ago. And I, and I like that, that idea because I think it looks at Earth in the concept of, you know, we're, we're not competing. We're, in, we're part of a neighborhood, and we need to see how we want to protect ourselves, look after our family in our home mm -hmm. so that we are going to be sustainable for the long term and that we don't create an environment in outer space that disadvantages us as individuals or as communities regardless of where we are on Earth. Because of how much more of a challenge it is to get into outer space as, for example, compared to Antarctica and other features that are unique to space exploration, what are some of the major problems or limitations to our current uh, space governance or policy framework? Some of the, the, the bottlenecks, if you will, well, in I terms it's of reestablishing. We, we don't have one. Mm. I'm not sure that we have a vision for outer space that is a collective vision that we can all subscribe to. Right. I don't believe that there are treaties and agreements that we, we could say that we firmly adopt and believe in and support. Uh, they don't exist. I mean, there, there are, are some the UN's developed. Of they're course there are, and they go back point, to right? the 60s and 70s. Yeah. And there are recent reports and ideas, but that's not part of the public domain. Right. That's not part of how we act and behave on a daily basis because historically space wasn't Sorry. important. It didn't matter. 
it does matter now because technology, the advances of technology and the advances of translating our imagination into realism, I mean, we are talking about living in outer space now. I mean, that's, that used to be a very distant concept. It's not so distant anymore. So when you have that change of environment, then you start to say, well, how are we going to behave? And who's going to govern the behavior that's out there? It's a really, really big question. Mm -hmm. We have research, we have scholarship, we have people working in the area, but the sphere is largely the business community and it's scientists and engineers and, and people with a big imagination or a big pocket. They've got the money to play in the outer space world. What we don't have are developing countries. We don't have uh, the broader public, uh, you know, who've even heard about it. We don't have disabled people's organizations or Aboriginal communities right. thinking about what is their role in this new environment. The parallel to this is that I don't think we've also learned from our past in terms of how we how we develop. You know, if you look at developing countries and the interaction between, say, developing and more developed nations, you know, I would argue in many respects they're more developed than we are. They're more sophisticated in some respects, and they're less sophisticated in other respects. But we are equal. It just is the balancing act is slightly different. In outer space, again, we're playing with the, the actors in outer space are the ones who have the resources. They're the more advanced in terms of technology. They're the ones who are more organized and shaped. But it can't work. It, it, we can't work in that context. Right. Every single country needs to be involved. And Every you, marginalized population needs to play a role. And I've heard you say that, quote, those who control the galaxy can control the world. Well, and that's I, the question. Or, I mean, that's my question. Well, right? I guess that's where we're at now, right? Yeah. It's who is who has the levers of control. Right. And from what you're saying, it's those who have, is it the, the capital to, to play in this well, I particular think, domain? You mean the capital in terms of? The financing, the I think the it varies. I think, think about communications. I mean, there are 1,200 satellites out there. Mm -hmm. And that, and there are another 2,000 that are floating around that aren't being used. Right. Who owns them? Well, it's about 60 or 70 countries. And it's private enterprise. And it is you know, a community who are active out there and who are on a daily basis looking back on Earth and shaping and influencing what we're doing now. So in, in to a certain extent, they are governing our behavior. They are governing what we know. They know more about us than we know about them. So without a governance system, we actually do have a form of a governance system. We have actors who in the past was, I think, traditionally Europe and Russia and the United States Today, the main actors are changing. You know, China and India. You know, there are other countries that are going to be very powerful uh, in this business, and they have to figure out ways to work together in this unknown space. Let's explore that because in your talk, you were mentioning, and it was staggering to hear this, that two thirds of the nations of the world are don't really have active space programs. Right. Do you see that changing? Are are many of these? so-called developing countries going to be bigger players in the future? How will that change the whole dynamic? Well, I guess, again, it depends on who the players are. Um, today, talent is mobile, ideas are borderless. And the mm -hmm. more people who get involved in the space agenda, the more opportunities for mobility for students from whatever country, the more opportunity that they will choose a space track in life. Why wouldn't they? If that interests them and they're at a university or in higher education or, or can access social media, you know, there, there are opportunities for people to ex start exploring the stars regardless of what country you're involved in. The reality today, though, is that space is expensive. It's very expensive. But again, as more technology and with more advances, things get less expensive. So again, eventually that will change as well. I just want to talk about one last concept, and I think it's actually a term that you coined, which is universalization. Yes. And can you tell me what this means and how it relates to space exploration? Sure. Um, it was almost, it's almost like a, a lack of knowing what to call it. We called it universalization. I think um, Ted Hewitt, uh, who is, uh, was a professor at Western University, actually still is a professor, mm -hmm. he's now the president of the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council. Mm -hmm. He and I put together a paper uh, for McGill Space and Law Conference, the Manfred Lacks Conference last year. And we were trying to come up with a phrase or a word that would capture what we see as the change that is taking place. And what we started to realize was that essentially we were shifting from a globalized agenda where competition and the 
sort of the emerging of emerging economies, but developing countries were still not partners in the process, right. to a direction where for the world within the universe to survive, we had to create a cooperative environment. So the concept of universal design, which actually the origins are groups of persons with disabilities who came up with universal design to improve access, seemed to fit. Because the idea is that if you have a universal design for people with disabilities, everybody benefits. Because we've all benefited from an accessibility agenda. We're all benefiting from an inclusive agenda. We're all benefiting if we all get to have play or, or partner together to move our agenda forward. We all benefit if we have the knowledge and information to make good decisions. And essentially that's the content, context of universalization. It's looking at the world within the universe in a way where we work collaboratively to solve world issues and, and could, to solve issues in outer space. And I could see that sort of working on the macro level in terms of policy, building inclusive policies, but also on the micro level. If you've got a, you know six or seven people together for two years going to Mars, maybe you want them to be able to cooperate in ways Absolutely. that they haven't been used to doing here on Earth. Yeah, I mean, I would like to see a shift from the concept of conflict negotiation to cooperation negotiation mm -hmm. as really the paradigm moving forward. Uh, conflict negotiation, I think, is much easier. And there's lots of scholarship in that area. There's not enough scholarship and there's not enough training of how do we negotiate in a cooperative paradigm? You know, how you cannot walk away from the table. It's not allowed because there's too much at stake. Sometimes life and death. Life and death. And that's the concept of universalization, is mm -hmm. that it, the, the role of outer space as we get more engaged there is impacting more on every single individual. There isn't anybody who's excluded from that paradigm. In globalization, we can, because it's international relations that are the barriers. It's, it's them and us. Right. right. Where universalization is all of us. Lauren and Jean Edmonds, thank you so much for joining us here at the Star Spot and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. This was a pleasure. Excellent. Thank you for joining us at the Star Spot, mind and universe continually expanding. The Star Spot with Justin Trottier is an astronomy and space themed podcast based out of Toronto, Canada. Please send comments or questions to starspotpodcast at gmail.com. The Star Spot is produced by Ying Zhang Li. Marketing and promotions by Natalie Morcos. Guest hosting by Denise Fong. News production by Benjamin Jenkins. News contributions from Julia Mazurchuk, Mallory Warren, Jessica Campbell, and Victoria Duncan. Web design by Blair Renault. Graphics by Carmina Svillins. And I'm your host, Justin Trottier. Thank you for listening.